In terms of the potential benefits of gene therapy for beta thalassemia worldwide, there's a great unmet need with 350,000 births worldwide of severe transfusion dependent beta thalassemia. So if we were able to genetically modify a person's own blood stem cells, the potential benefits include an addressing of the root cause of the disease, so it's compelling in terms of its logic, but importantly, patients who have their own genetically modified cells that are now making normal beta globin will be able to avoid the problems of lifelong blood transfusion, expo exposure to blood products, as well as iron overload risks. One of the other potential benefits of autologous gene modified hemopoietic stem cell gene therapy is that one can avoid allogeneic bone marrow transplantation and in so doing avoid the risks of morbidity and indeed mortality and a particular risk of graft versus host disease in the long term. Another benefit of gene therapy for beta thalassemia is that it's a single treatment and in so doing one doesn't then require lifelong interventions, lifelong blood transfusions and other reliance on interventions that might other otherwise require regular visits to a doctor. The potential pitfalls and challenges of achieving gene therapy for beta thalassemia have really been substantial. It's a compellingly logical idea to address the root cause of the disease. But the main challenges have included achieving efficient gene transfer such that we get over the hurdle of about 25% donor chimerism equivalent, which is to produce enough of the beta globin to actually make a clinical benefit and therefore afford patients the alternative of overcoming a lifelong reliance on blood transfusion. In technical terms, the opportunity to centralise the manufacturing of gene therapy for patients has been a big, big challenge. We need to overcome cold change challenges as well as transmitting patient cells in a very secure manner from one centre to another in order to genetically modify them in a centralised manufacturing facility. In addition to that, there's always been the concern of so-called genotoxicity or insertional mutagenesis, wherein there's the possibility of a gene addition vector causing mutations in the patient's own cell's DNA. That's been a concern throughout the history of gene therapy, and we believe that that, that has been overcome using the current technology. Nonetheless, we need to be vigilant about such things, and long-term follow-up is absolutely essential. In terms of the emerging technologies of gene therapy for beta thalassemia, we can categorise them into three main subtypes. There's the gene modification leading to an increase in haemoglobin F, and that's predominantly been by targeting the BC11A gene, which is an attempt to increase haemoglobin F using a clever methodology. That is an experimental method and currently under clinical trial. Another method that's been examined in the earliest phases is CRISPR or gene editing technologies using various methodologies to try and either modify the, the root cause of the beta thalassemia or indeed to alter the way the gene is expressed. But emerging as the most promising technology currently is using lentiviruses to genetically add back a form of the beta globin gene or indeed the normal beta globin gene in autologous cells that have been genetically modified and those cells are either returned systemically where they home to the bone marrow or they're injected into the bone marrow and both of those technologies have been published and have shown to, to be promising. Indeed, the European Union has now approved the use of lentiglobin gene therapy for beta thalassemia in a particular subgroup of patients with non-beta-0, beta-0 genotypic transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia with specific requirements of eligibility and at specific centres in Europe. In terms of selecting patients who would be eligible for gene therapy in the context of transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia, it's very important to have an extensive attempt at consenting patients and providing them all the information necessary for a proper informed consent. And that includes members of their families or guardians and people who would be supportive in the context of the journey of receiving autologous gene therapy for beta thalassemia. Questions of fertility long-term, questions of exposure to myeloablative 
chemotherapy, which is currently required, and indeed eligibility criteria need to be fulfilled. Further than that, long-term follow-up is required in all of these patients, and monitoring for many, many years, up to 15 years and beyond, is currently mandated. And therefore, as a consequence, there are many, many factors that only expert centres are able to communicate with patients in order to give them fully informed consent and understand what they're getting into in the current context of many different alternative experimental as well as approved therapies in the context of transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. Factors to consider when translating from clinical trial to clinical practice include the formal eligibility criteria that have been uh, defined by jurisdictions that have approved these therapies, eligibility including a, an ability to uh, provide informed consent, fertility questions, the necessity to commit to long-term follow-up, and the other issues for families to consider, which include the burden of the disease and serious alternatives to gene therapy and gene addition technologies in the context of transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. It's never been a better time to be in the context of studying transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. Nonetheless, every family has their own issues that they need to consider. Every patient has their own specific circumstances, concerns. Some may emphasize fertility above others and therefore they need to consider the context of myeloablative chemotherapy in that manner. And therefore, to the extent that every patient is different, it means that there needs to be expert centres familiar with this technology in order to convey the pros and cons each time that that is discussed.